Hey, we're Matrix and Future Bound, and we are currently in West London, and we're going to run you through our masterclass for computer music. And we're going to show you how we put together one of our tracks called Let It Go. So let's get to it. So yeah, there's many different ways that you can start tracks. Um, obviously, sometimes you, you attack it by just going straight to the drop and, and working on the beats and the bass. Uh, on this occasion, we started um, just around a 16 bar loop with just a, a simple massive patch um, and getting some nice chords in place um, and then building on layers um, until we were kind of happy and about building it towards a drop, you know? So yeah, this is the starting point of the track, which is basically um, a set of chords that we really liked. It's got a good vibe and it sort of felt like um, kind of, um, it's got a nice hypnotic vibe about it and almost like the sort of thing you would find in a like progressive house tune, say, and uh, which we're, we're big fans of that kind of stuff. And a lot of those tracks, I think, um, they arrange them in a certain way where it's a nice long journey and the high point of, of the track is pretty much the breakdown. So I think that was a general idea, yeah. like how can we just keep this simple chord loop kind of building and sounding interesting yeah. over. I think, I think the general vibe of the, of the chords that we got in place and obviously adding the, the delays and reverbs to kind of give it that atmospheric vibes it was kind of leading us down that sort of path to kind of do a progressive building track. Yeah, so I mean, the, the uh, basic chord part is made in massive, and it's a sort of classic uh, kind of saw wave um, synth patch, basically. And what we have done is do a bunch of automation on the filters and um, added a load of delay we've got on there, uh, a waves delay, and we have got delays and reverbs always play a, a big part in our, in our overall sound. Yeah, but it's, so, so um, I think let's play, we'll play the first 16 bars of the track so you can see how it's put together. But we were basically we're over, or 32 bars, I should say, we kind of wanted to, want the synth to start nice and small, dry, and gradually kind of build, open up, and reverbs come in, and etc. And then um, a kind of switch when it drops, so that all kind of goes out and it goes very dry again. So that goes like this. So the release of the stab is quite short here, you know, as, as the sequence is rolling through. Gradually automate the summit opening up. So yeah, that's the, that's the opening 32, and uh, so we, we've bounced that synth down to an audio file so that we can, uh, add, we bounce it down with um, a Waves filter plug-in, low-pass filter, and the reason we bounce it down rather than just leaving it live in the track is because um, <coughs> what you'll find if, you, if you're putting a plug-in like, like most low-pass filters, if you leave it on, even though it's filtered right up here by 32 bars, if you leave that plug inactivated, it can mess with the top end of your signal, like kind of uh, mess with a very high frequency. So it's best to not, I find, to not leave a filter like that activated, even if you think you're not really using it because the filter's all the way up. So for that reason, we bounce it down to, to an audio file. So just that opening 32 has got the filter plug in on it. Um, Let's yeah. go through some more of the uh, the layers that we've got going on. Yeah, here. so as this intro section is building up. Yeah, so we've got um, in here we've got a 
basically taken, we've taken the uh, chord progression, kind of dropped it down an octave, and uh, I've got a patch here made on silent, which is a synth that we use absolutely loads. And uh, we use it because it sounds great, and it's also, it's a very quick and easy synth to create sounds with. So, um, you know, that's always important, I think, because it's all well and good if you've got a, a plugin that's amazingly powerful, but if you're sort of constantly having to refer to the manual or, or sort of scratch your head trying to remember where a certain parameter is, it kind of kills the vibe a bit. So we've Silence been... always great for like the melodic elements of the tracks that we use, you know? Yeah. Always, um, always seems to be that go-to synth when you need to get the right uh, layers for your, your melodies and stuff. Yeah, that's one of our top three, I'd say. So we've got that fading in uh, in the background to thicken it up. And we have also got, so that's just a, a simple bass pad doing the, the notes, the chord progression to, to... Just gives you that extra lift after the first 16 as a kind of a signal towards a, you know, an edging towards a drop. Yeah, so automating up in volume there. And then, oops, we've got another silent patch here, which has got Decapitator on it, which is a really nice distortion plugin, which you use quite a lot. Um, and it's quite sort of, quite versatile, because you can just do kind of a subtle saturation with it ranging up to kind of total annihilation of your signal. So that's uh, one which features quite regularly for us. But that's, um, this is what that one. <coughs> Just take the, uh, the decapitator off, Joe, so we can have a listen to it without. Yeah, so. So it's actually what we're doing there is actually pretty subtle. Yeah, it's very subtle, but yeah. it's just adding, it just makes the sound a little bit more fuller, a little bit more bite on the top end. And what else have we got in there? So we've got these couple of synth parts, both doing sort of more or less the same thing. Um, we're big fans of arpeggiators. Yeah. They, they seem to feature heavily in our tracks. Yeah. Definitely in the melodic ones anyway. And this uh, is, what is Retrolog, it's called. It's one of the synths which comes, uh, sorry, Spectre, uh, which comes with Cubase. Uh, with they're, they're both Cubase synths, these ones, aren't they? Both of the arps. Yeah. Um, and we, uh, yeah, it's not, that's, I don't think that's a specially regular synth for us to use. But no, it's not. It's yeah, just be one of those. That yeah, we have but to I think obviously when day. we started this track, it was um, we were around a, some downtime in, in LA, in between shows, and we were just around the pool, just thinking. So obviously we were limited, you know, a synth that we were working on the laptop. So it was uh, mainly Cubase only stuff, really. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. It's easy to sort of bypass the the, the sort of stock plugins which will come with Cubase or, or whatever DAW you're using. I think a lot of people subconsciously think they're not very yeah. good, but a lot of them are actually quite decent. Yeah, everyone goes for the, uh, the, the tried and trusted third party plugins and synths and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, sometimes, as Jamie said, you just forget about you have actually got it all built in the door that you're using, you know? Yeah. So that, the part that is doing. And that's the other one. So they're, you know, they're quite low in the mix, but it's, I guess um, that kind of thing is just a little bit of extra ear candy. You don't necessarily, uh, when you're listening to the track, you don't pick up on it specifically or focus on it, but it's just uh, all part of... Uh, the you atmospheric know, layers, yeah. isn't it? And part of the whole idea of just taking one simple chord progression and how can we make it keep sounding interesting, keep moving and developing and changing. It's like adding quite subtle things in like that around it to make it feel bigger. So we've got all those layers of synth and what we have done with them just uh, as it goes into the drop, which I'll just play a few bars now.
So it's, it's all basically going to one group, and it's um, we've got a plugin on there, a plugin called Valhalla Shimmer, which is um, a really nice plugin actually. That is basically a very very big and long reverb. You can pretty much set it up to go on forever if you want to. Um, but we've got all of uh, that music going to that group, and we. Um, if I can just find the track, if you bear with me. So as Jamie saying, every element of, of the intro there is going through to this one group. And the, the shimmer plugin delay and reverb is just kind of, it's kind of automating it to, to kind of sound like, you know, like huge just before the drop. Yeah, so um, just all kind of uh, at the very end. Yeah, it just turns into a nice kind of wash of sound and then, then uh, on the drop goes straight back to dry. And uh, with, with all the drum elements as well on the intro, they, uh, we bounce those down. So all this stuff. And we've done basically the same thing with that. We've done the same thing with that, but the reason um, we've bounced that down rather than just putting that through with the rest of the music is what you'll find, like probably with most doors, but with Cubase certainly, you're, you can't rely on your automation to be perfectly 100% uh, bang on time. <coughs> so when you've got really um, obvious elements that where it's very important that the timing is perfect, like drums, or something that's very, very prominent, and you're doing automation on your plugins, you have to be careful because if if you, if I had automated those drums into with that reverb going fully wet, and then I'm trying to bring it back dry right on the drop, and I just automate it right on the beat, it's basically going to miss the first um, hit of the drums. So I don't want it to do that. So for that reason. All those drum parts have been bounced down to one file and the reverb has been applied to that. And then when the drums actually come in, you're getting a full punch of the drums in. Exactly, you're getting a nice, super, super clean yeah. hit on the drums. And you don't want the tail end of the reverb stuff going over exactly, yeah. into the drop because then that's going to take the initial power away from the drums. Yeah, so that section there is the tail of the reverb over the drop so we've got rid of that so so it's a big big long reverb but it stops dead on the drop but yeah shimmer that's a really nice plugin that we've only started using it recently but it's really nice for that kind of thing yeah we used to use the uh the PSP. PSP, yeah, used to be our favourite. Yeah, that was, well, that was, that was like, during our universal truth days we were kind of <laughs> that was our go-to uh delay and stuff and uh yeah yeah, this is our new one. Yeah, long reverbs and uh, tape delays yeah. we were quite big Absol abusers of. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, going into the next section, obviously, all the main elements are working here. Um, it's a case then of getting to the drop action. Um, and I'm pulling out, the, finding the right beats to kind of sit right and complement the, the elements that we've got working in the track yeah, on the music talk, side. Should we talk about drums? Yeah, um, I, I think, think when, when we do tracks as well, it, it's we're not always writing a, a track from scratch. You know, we're, we're sometimes we're doing prep sessions where we're, we're just writing beats, bass, patches, or whatever, and that kind of helps with the workflow of um, when you have got a vibe like this going in the studio. You know, you've, you've got uh, a lot of different beats to kind of choose from, and because not every every beat's going to kind of work, and sometimes it's it's a long process. Um, to get the right ones working together. Um, so yeah, I think here we've got, scrolling through our hard drives on, on beats that we've worked on before. Um, I'm finding some key kicks, snares. Let's, I've got down here, well yeah, let's, so let's just get a quick blast of the drums on their own. <laughs> 
that's all the drums we've got going on. And um, this is the main snare is basically a whole bunch of layers of stuff. Um, whole bunch of layers uh, layered together and the, the key basically to layering up snares like that is well, a few things but probably most important thing is where you're tuning them to having them tuned to the, the fundamental tone of the snare is, is working together with your other snares and, and the, the track and the track potentially yeah and uh that they're in phase as well is the other important thing and the, the, the timing is right they're your basic yeah. things and I think our approach in a way to making snares is rather than maybe having a snare and thinking oh it needs some more bite some more top end or some more weight or some more sustain and, and trying to achieve that by processing it with an EQ or compressor or what have you often rather than doing that we'll try and find other samples we can bring in to sort of give it what it needs so that's why probably like a lot of people you end up with lots of stuff layered together yeah there's yeah. always one key kick or snare that's kind of leading the way um but obviously yeah as james just said then let's kind of find some other layers just to add extra bite extra transient on one of the others or you know so just adding various elements to, to make that overall one sound uh, correct. And I think for, for, you know, when you're layering your snares, you want to get them tuned. The, the, obviously you use your ears, but what makes it a lot easier is using some kind of analyzer. So basically all, all our main snares that have got weight in them are tuned. So you can see there, that's the fundamental note of your snare, which is around about, about two, 225 hertz or so. And the way you can do that, I mean, there's various ways you can do it, but you can either, you could put your snares in a sampler, it would be one way and tune them. And I mean, the way we do it generally is... We used to put our, our beats into the uh, contact. Yeah, I mean, exactly. We? That's what we used to do. Yeah, we were kind of grew up on writing our tracks in like EMU samplers and Akai samplers, and that was the way of doing beats, standard procedure. Um, but then we found, not long after doing Universal Truth, the first album, was that they sounded a lot faster just coming out in audio. Um, so we stopped doing it that way. So the way we would pitch a snare is in Cubase. If you go to the algorithm here, if you choose uh, one that is Elastic Pro Tape, and then you get your time stretch tool, as you time stretch it, it's, it's not actually time stretching, it's just playing it back at a different pitch. So some people use actual pitch shift algorithms, which I would never do on drums because it most likely is going to mess up your transients. So you either want to put them in a sampler or find a way to do it, which is just playing your sample back at at a different pitch rather than pitch shifting. So yeah, basically you want to get, is, if you've got a snare that said you've high passed all the bottom end out of it, you don't have to really worry about it necessarily. But if a snare's where you've got that low end weight in it, you basically want to make sure they're all hitting at the same frequency. And the other thing you want to be doing is um, experiment with flipping the phase of them because you, you're going to probably find that one one way sounds really good and the other way cancels out all your low end against your other layers so you definitely want to experiment with flipping the phase when you're layering your snares up uh, so yeah basically I think your rules are get them in time get them tuned the same get them in phase when we bounced all that down that becomes that so that's our sort of combination of 10 or so layers and um what we've done with that is so that's just this green one up there is just the dry sample 
this one down here is the dry sample, but um, I've turned it up here by six and a half dB, but then used uh, the pencil tool to go in and draw a volume curve on it. And uh, so effectively, um, I've turned down the transient of the snare, the front end, and then turned the whole thing back up. And what that does is boost the tail so it sounds like a kind of more sustained more sustained snare so it's like that's before and that's after so it's got a bit it basically boosts the tail which you could do with an envelope shaper or you could do with a compressor but I quite like doing it that way because then it's very precise exactly where you want it it's the same every time and uh, yeah, it's just very reliable. So that's pretty much a snare. I mean, and then on top of that, we've just added a couple of additional little bits, basically claps. Claps are just giving it the extra top end sort of life. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And like, oh, like there's no low end going on with any of that stuff. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So that, is our snare. I mean, as you can sort of see, it's just a case of you add a load of ingredients, you potentially bounce it down, you add a load more, and then you know you you, you bounce again and add and so on. It's like a continuous growth. Um, and then this is like this is our main kick, which this is like the M and F. Yeah, yeah. The it's M &F from a kick. track that we did called Magnetic Eyes uh, about five six years ago. Um, that just always seems to actually we use on all I know. For yeah, it's me. been it's, it's had a longer life yeah, than that. Yeah. I think this has been he's on had the a good go shelf like yeah. this one. Um, but but yeah. I think a lot of people with drum and bass, you find that nice kick that works. I think a, a lot of people tend to stick yeah. stick to it. We don't always use it, but it's that that kick is probably in. It just always seems to work with the, the type of tracks that we that we make, you know. And yeah, because I think what you want from a kick with drum and bass is. You want it to have weight and punch and snap to it, but it's got to be not super low end that's going to mess with your bass. And this particular kick just seems to work really nicely with And again, this is a, a, a number of elements that are making this kick as well. So let's play this whole lot of drums. So it's that kick and that snare with... Actually, um, I'm just going to bypass what's on our master bus for now. So that's the snares we just talked about and the kick and plus uh, a bunch of hi-hat ridey stuff. Uh, it's, what have we got in here? We've got this, uh, that's a contact kit. So using the hi-hats from that. So basically a bunch of hats like that. And I think on this particular, well, so they, they are going all to our drum group, but there's no processing on that. Just, just uh, going straight to our drum group. We've got a good old fashioned aim and break in there, high past. Which, uh, this is another element that always seems to feature in our track, just hidden away. Yeah. Always just adds that little kind of underlying energy and pace to, to the beats that we're doing. It's quite low in the mix of, of the drums, but between that and this shaker, they just give it that little bit of shuffliness. some ride layers that's like an old uh, I don't know where we sampled it from but an old live break that is a nice ride I think from a sample pack made by our friends pendulum from way back um, and then low in the mix as well just pretty much a bit of white noise which has got a side chain on it which kind of it's not a 
thing you want to use too much of, but it can be nice just low, low in the mix. So that has got a little bit of um, this Fab Filter Saturn, which is quite a nice plug-in. It's like a saturation, the distortion plug-in, and it can that without and that's with so it's quite subtle but it can be quite nice this plug-in when you play if you're using it on drums you play around with this dynamics control because it can give you good kind of like pumping compression sound if you want that or just more straightforward kind of saturation but um, yeah that we, we're fans of fab filter stuff, it sounds nice. So base, so that loop then was bounced down to um, a drum loop, and then it's ended up in this track. But that we actually made that before the track. On the, I mean, normally we kind of we wouldn't really do it that way. I guess we'd do a track and we'd build the drums within it. But on this particular one, we kind of made that first and then we were making this track and we were like, oh, let's grab some drums and we put that in the session. Yeah, once we've uh, bounced the drums down um, when we've got those number of combinations working together, it's, it's kind of get, get them in the session again now and also try and find any other layers that we can kind of enhance the drums further. Um, and get, a bit more of doing the same of what we were doing before, but <laughs> um, yeah, a couple of more snares, claps, um, as well as some more percussion stuff like some more hats. Uh, one thing that we're actually guilty of is actually using too many yeah, that is true. Of, of percussion. That is true. Uh, we've actually, in this one, we've got like a, there's a track we did a few years ago called The Wall, and um, this is not something we would typically do at all, but we've just got the whole drums out of that track high pass there and uh, compressed like a fair bit and then sort of used as almost like just a sparkly hi-hat top end layer effectively I guess. I think sometimes you, when you're showing people like, that, how you're doing things like this and you're like well why are you doing add more and more stuff but when you actually mute a few things out it actually does make a difference and it's actually adding to the flavour of what, what the drums are doing you know. Yeah but yeah so basically this <coughs> this Processing wise, there's not much going on. It's just c combining the right elements together. And then it's all or mostly going to, where are we going to? Um, a drums group, which has got another uh, Fab Filter Saturn doing a little bit of compression and, and also a slate. Uh, Ray compressor, which we use quite a lot, and we also often use it uh, with the mix somewhere like you know, not, isn't it? yeah, exactly, or so somewhere around there, not all the way wet because it's sort of I think it um, just lets your transients of your drums remain a bit more intact. So you do a bit, you maybe have the compressor set to do a bit more compression, but then back off the mix. So you get the same effect, but you still get, uh, you know, the, the, the dry sort of how they are sounding naturally, and you're getting the extra fifty percent extra compression. Yeah. So, um, that's without those two plugins, and that's with. So you know, it's not like a wild, drastic change, but it just kind of glues it all together a little bit keeps it all under control. One thing to do as well is that actually, you know, when you're getting your drums in place, is kind of keep on switching boot back and forth between mono and stereo, just see how different they are. If, if sounds are falling off, you know, and it's sounding dramatically different, well then you probably want to address that. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that sometimes can be a battle, can't it? Because yeah, it's yeah. sort of... Sometimes if it, it's all sounding nice and lively in stereo, you get it on a system and you'll get a, a short, sharp shock um, sometimes if you haven't got the drums right, you know, especially yeah. with drum and bass music. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly like your main kind of kick and snare yeah. need to be pretty mono. 
Um, I think that's about it for the drums. I mean, there's another, like, another, this snare here. Just providing a nice little top end snap. This, this sample has actually got a whole load of bass, which I would never really recommend sampling a snare that's got a full on bass line in it, but sort of got away with it on that occasion. And it's, it's like a low in the mix thing, but it just gives the final bit of snap to our snare, basically. probably covers how the drums are put together on this track. So that's all we've got time for in part one. But if you want to see the rest, you can get the latest issue of Computer Music and you can see it all there.